Bryce Van Patten with Metal Express Radio Backstage. Today, my guest is Norman Skinner of the band Nivian, power metal band based out of Sacramento, California, working on their third release. The last two, The Druid King 2017, excellent album, Ruthless Divine 2020, new album in the works, and my guest, Norman Skinner. And how's it going today, Norman? Fantastic, man. I'm in a metal mood. If somebody hadn't heard of Nivian, how would you personally describe uh, the sound of your band? That, that's easy because we, we self-identify, or we'll do that. We self-identify as heavy, heavy American power metal or American heavy power metal, whatever it be. And the, the and reason we you want to put heavy and metal. Yeah. And, and the re- right. we're definitely a power metal band. That is for sure. Um, I think the United States portion of it or the, the American power metal band comes in because you hear a lot of traditional metal in our power metal. Uh, a lot of that U S picking and stuff, you know, everyone says, which is funny, right? Because the bands that they always throw at us are priests and maiden, but that's new wave of British heavy metal. It's not, no, they're not power metal at all. Right. And I guess Hell, you Halloween is with power them. metal, right? Right. Gamma yeah. ray, you know, so, but we definitely have that European sound, but we also have a very American influence to it. Um, and we like to throw the heavy in there because when people hear power metal, they're like, oh, you mean like Rhapsody and maybe like some like Halloween and stuff? I'm like, no, nah, we're a lot heavier in our sound than bands like that. We're more like the Mystic Prophecy, uh, Brainstorm, Primal Fear. That's kind of the vein we run in um, with our music. And our first album, our first album, and I'm going to put this out here out, out here because I know that um, a lot of people heard the difference between the first and the second album. Um, it wasn't just a growth. The first album was a bunch of guys getting together that already had songs right. that they brought in. Um, so if they weren't re- only like two tracks on that album, I think were written as a band where someone brought it in and we do the process we do now. Everything else was like, here's a song. It's pretty much set, you know, except for the vocals, I still would do those from scratch um now the ruthless divine and our new album it's mm-hmm. more this is divine's core sound this is what we sound like this is the songs you're getting you know and people say oh i hear right. some amana marth in there i hear some orden ogan in there you know um our new we debuted a new song and a lot of people were saying arch enemy so we're definitely dear heavying it up but still uh-huh. keeping the melodic and the dynamic in there and the first album definitely i think is going to go down as our lightest uh, more polished <laughs> album out of any of them because we just keep getting more like, you know? Yeah. Well, it felt really polished to me. I, I only heard the Druid King and uh, I, I felt that you guys have a wide range of kind of metal styles all melded together. Um, hear, he, hearing things that reminded me of old Queens, right? Not necessarily their sound, but just, you know what I mean? Their feel yeah. and, and that, um, another question I had for you, you said you guys uh, got to tour with Soulfly. What was the funnest or craziest thing that happened to you guys on that tour? Well, unfortunately due to COVID, there wasn't a lot of crazy times to be had other than, <laughs> right. other than us. Yeah. Other than us keeping our ourselves entertained. Right. Yeah. COVID had its foot upon everything. <laughs> Right. But I mean, we see, we saw the standard nuts things. I mean, I think in Denver, you know, there were people having sex in an alley and we're like, what the hell? And there was, you know, we saw some fights outside at one and, um, you know, just random things that you see like that, the, the, the weird tweakers that approach you and knock on your, your bus door. Oh. But, but we like to, uh, we're a very professional band. We don't, most of the band doesn't drink at all. Um, and then the few of us that do on tour, it's very light. Me, I never do any of that on tour because vocally the stuff I do, I night after night, I have to keep in shape, but you know, a lot of our fans, the really diehard fans, they, uh, they, when they follow us on tour, they'll see two kinds of videos. One will be from the other guys posting backstage, walking around, sound checking all the stuff that fans normally see. When they follow me, they don't see any of that. They see what we call the, the wildebeest hunt. And, and what, uh, what is the wildebeest hunt? Okay, so it started on our first tour with Sirenia and Threat Signal back in 2018. Our bass player was sleeping in the back. He was snoring really loud. So all of a sudden, I just take my phone and I come up with this like mix of Scottish-Australian accent. And I'm like, did I make 
we're going to hunt the wild wildebeest. And then I'm like hunting through the bus. I'm like, the smell is terrible. It smells like what donkey ball sack, you know, and we're going to go through. And then finally I showed, I'm like, oh, it was just a stinky bass, snoring bass player. Well, he became this wildebeest. So every tour I've roped people in and we're like, uh, you know, one time we brought on the singer from vicious rumors on the bus and uh, he was in it and he was like this warrior and we were on this hunt and it just became this whole thing. So every time I'm on tour, I do these videos where we're hunting the, the members of the band that snore ultimately. Right. And that's it just become a thing where the fans are like, you know, you're going to do that again. And so every tour, that's what we do. And that's yeah, my a, way tra of tradition now, right? Yeah. So that's my way of staying sane. And just, um, and if you want to watch those, just, if you go to my personal YouTube, Norman Skinner, look for the YouTube channel. Okay. There's like the episodes are all there. They're dumb. <laughs> They're so dumb. I don't know why people like them, but at the same time you find yourself laughing. You're like, this is so stupid. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that's the funniest stuff. It's, yeah. It's absolutely. And that keeps, you know, keeps us entertained, but also I think it kind of keeps us out of trouble too. Right. We're yeah, keep, keep using our pain as well. Right. You know, you can laugh at things and, and, uh, Cause it's, it was pretty oppressive here the last couple of years. Yeah. Who was the most inspiring vocalist for you growing up? That, ah, okay. That, so that led you, because I know you didn't start out as a vocalist. No, um, I didn't start out as anything. <laughs> <laughs> were was, you playing guitar? What were you doing? Okay. So tell me how your heavy metal story started. All right. I'll, I'll expand on it. It's, it's, awesome. it's different. It's different. All right. Here I am, seventh grade, just a horn, <laughs> horny middle-aged kid, right? I mean, we all were. And I'm watching, and I was growing up, honestly, I didn't have a, I didn't have older brothers or anything or sisters. I didn't have older friends that were turning me on to new music. I had MTV. So the bands I was watching were, you know, Def Leppard, Motley Crue. I mean, this is what was predominantly on during that time. So I grew up very much immersed in the hair metal. But a lot of hot girls in those videos, right? Always. Always. So I'm sitting here watching like a poison or slaughter video going, I think I'm going to learn to play guitar. <laughs> um, I asked my parents and you'll get a kick out of this since you're, you are a guitar player. I'm like, for Christmas, I want a guitar, you know, I want amps. I want the whole, the whole, the whole deal. Right. Christmas morning comes. I'm thinking I'm going to get a flying V. I'm going to get a Marshall stack. I got a nylon string classical acoustic guitar and some <laughs> Mel Bay teach yourself how to play books. That's what I got. So you're just like everybody else then. Right. You know, right. Um, parents want to see how kids go through phases, right? And parents yeah. want to make sure that this isn't one of those phases where they buy you, you know, thousand dollars worth of gear that gets dusty. Exactly. And you've moved on to something else a month later, right? Right. And they're glad they're, you know, I'm sure they're glad they did that. I mean, I remember sitting there trying to play like I'm not, I still don't play any instruments, but I think it was like a G or something. I, I, mean, I couldn't get, I can't even do the Spock thing. Okay. I couldn't get my <laughs> fingers to go. And I finally got fed up and I'm like, F it. My fingers hurt. I put it in the closet. Fast forward, sophomore, junior year of high school. Yeah. I'm hanging out with a buddy who I just had met because our girlfriends were friends. And we were in my room because my parents weren't home yet. We could make out in my room, right? And he saw, after the girls left, he saw, you know, I had a Metallica poster and a right. Bon Jovi and Def Leppard or whatever, right? And he's like, you're in a metal? I'm like, yeah, man. And he's like, uh, and he started talking about how he, how he wanted to play guitar. Right. Well, now, all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm the coolest dude ever. I'm like, I got a guitar. Okay, I go <laughs> dig in, I dig through my closet. The supports inside are busted. The, the headstock's cracked. It's got one steel strings left that's rusty. And his eyes lit up. Anyway, I was cool. I just gave it to him. He Sweet. went on, he went on to become a guitar player. He learned to play guitar. While I was hanging around with him and the senior, the senior that he knew, um, a friend of ours who had passed since passed away, he was getting guitar lessons and I was just hanging out. Right. They got a little band together. It wasn't a band. It was just a group of guys that were going to play the talent show. Okay. Wow. And this is going to, people are going to know exactly how old I am. Once I say this, <laughs> this is my junior year of high school, we we're going to play the two most popular releases at that time. We we're going to play Enter Sandman. It smells right. like teen spirit. Okay. Sounds like 1991. That is like 92. Yeah. So you're, yeah. you're right there. Yeah, so right there. They, their singer happened to bail on them literally two weeks, I think, before they were going to play this show. He was a guy, he sung in the school choir, supposedly, and he got cold feet. I don't know what. Right. They call me. 
the other guitar player who I didn't know as well called me and he's like, Hey dude, you got to sing. We lost her singer. I'm like sing. I don't sing. I sing in the shower in my underwear in my room. No one had ever heard me sing. And I sucked. I was not good at all, but I was, I'm a guy that's always up for a good adventure. I said, I would do it. I played the show with them. We got disqualified because the kids jumped on stage and were pitting on stage and stage diving. And I caught the bug. And that is how, that's my origin story. It was a complete fluke accident that's that awesome. I became a metal singer. And so did you end up staying with those guys? Did it go be any farther or was that nope, a, a one-off that, thing that just lit It was just life? a one-off. It sparked it. And then from there I started um, in California. I grew up in the Bay Area. So very much big thrash scene. And um, I just started looking through this, this magazine that we call Bay Area Music, a very famous publication. And, uh, you know, I, I ran, I, I ultimately, after a bunch of bad auditions and jamming with what I call the circle, you know, that circle of the same musicians that just jump from band to band. It's the same one. You go to another audition and there's a guy that you saw at the last one or something. Yeah. You know? And he was in the other band. I decided I would look for people that were more um, mature and had actually done stuff. So I joined my very first band called Tramontane. They already had like three worldwide cassette demos out there in the underground. Sweet. You know, and they were about a good 10 years older than me. And I was the kid. And that's how I kind of started paying my dues. And I learned I need to take some lessons, started taking vocal lessons. And that just, I followed the path, you know? Yeah. If, if you had to name one singer that's inspirational to you, who would it be? Oh man, I might, if you the had guy that I, the, the one guy that I, that I listen to and I'm like, wow, I think we have a similar voice. I think we have a similar style. And I uh -huh. very much look up to would be Matt Barlow, a uh, former Ice Earth singer. Uh -huh. Uh, he he's in ashes of Aries now people compare the, the interviews all the time you know uh, reviews they say i sound like matt barlow i think he's a hundred times better than i am but at the same time i aspire to be as good as he is um well you're an excellent singer i i, I think you're doing a great uh, thank job thank you so <laughs> <laughs> you know from from not even from getting talked into the job you know Right. <laughs> At one point in life, you've you've certainly uh, taken that and ran with it. You guys have a twin guitar sound. I wanted to ask you now: the guitar players and the bass player do some of the writing. Do those guys work together when they're working on those parts, or how does that work out? Especially when you've got a lot of harmony guitar parts. Yeah. So what they'll do is these two guys just work so killer together. Um, the guitar player Gary Tarpley, he his favorite band of all time is Maiden, so mm -hmm. he's very much in tune with that. And then Mark Minor, you know, he's he's a, I mean, he's been a guitar teacher for over thirty years, but you know, he's very much into the masters. Ingve Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, you know, he he's a he, he's a student of that era. But mm -hmm. and all of those guys are just one guitar player, but he always wanted that twin guitar attack. Right. as well so what happens is they'll write their songs right mm -hmm. but they each keep space they're like this is going to be my solo this is going to be your solo hey how about we're, we're just going to do a harmony solo here we're going to mm -hmm. harmony here so they keep each other in mind so they'll write the song itself but they'll uh whoever's writing the song will write the harmony parts that they'll write and leave it open for the other guy's solo and then they oh, just great. teach each other's stuff so when we actually get back in the studio after it's all been, you know, chopped up and re put that together. That's when they'll sit there and they'll work on them together. Oh, this is what you wrote. And you sent me the video. And yeah, but they're very much like they're two pieces about these guys are like best buddies and they just write together and work, you know, work on things together. I couldn't be happier. You know, I'm just sitting there going, that's what everybody wants in your band. If you have two, you want two guys that are just like, absolutely. It's like, you know, downing and tipped in back in the day. Absolutely. Um, and it keeps growing every, I mean, the Druid King ultimately was a band, uh, you know, like Gary only had one song on mm -hmm. the Druid King album, but by the time we got to the Ruthless Divine, he had written about 70% of the album. Um, right. So it was a real big change. We, uh, you know, we incorporated way more dual leads, way more guitar harmonies. And with this third album, we're still going that direction. It, it's mm -hmm. just really becoming a, it's going to be a staple sound for our band. Absolutely. When I hear the tone of the guitars, those harmony leads, they really reminded me of Power Slave and Two Minutes to Midnight and that tone that Maiden used to get when they played Marshalls. 
I don't know if they're back playing Marshalls again these days, but <laughs> I know they went to Gallen Kruger in the mid eighties and their whole tone changed. Do you know what kind of rigs your, your guys run or? Yeah. Um, well, they, they are total gearheads and they're always trying new stuff. They mm-hmm. have no problem spending money on it. Um, and I know nice. that. So they just recently changed again. So I know that they both had Kempers, which they're not using anymore. Now Gary has gone to a new fractal. It's like, it almost looks like two uh, foot switches in one, like one, but it's some new mm-hmm. fractal thing. And uh, he was using the matrix and uh, matrix uh, speaker amps or whatever. Mm-hmm. So the last I looked, that's what he was using. They're both Ibanez players. Uh, they're mm-hmm. Ibanez endorsed. Mark got rid of the Kemper. He's a very uh, VH, the 5150 and the mm-hmm. EVH cabinets. And now he's also got, he got rid of his Kemper and now he's using a bunch of the EVH. Like he's putting some pedals together to get the sounds he wants. So mm-hmm. they, they were fractal. Then they went to Kemper and now Gary's back to fractal. And now Mark's going very EVH on all his stuff. So I never know. The stage plot is always insane because whenever <laughs> I'm like, what are you guys using now? You know, they're very much gearheads and it's, it changes and definitely not just album to album, but it's almost rehearsal to rehearsal. It seems. You're recording the new album. Can you talk to me about your recording process for the record coming up and how that's going to happen? Yeah. So uh, in, in, I think it's next week, this next weekend, we're going to be entering uh, studio, studio Fang Studios in San Mateo, and we're going to be tracking mm-hmm. drums. So basically what we do is that's the only thing that we do in-house in an actual studios with the drums, because mm-hmm. trying to do those yourself. I mean, if you want to get a good drum sound, you really have to go to a professional and, uh, you know, with the right mics, the right room and the, the right room mic. matters. The Absolutely. Um, aside from that, you know, um, before what we learned is uh, the drummer. I don't know. It seems that drummers, if you can be there and you can actually lay down the, you know, scratch track or, or have mm-hmm. something to them to play to, you're going to get a much better result. So we learned that um, on the recording the ruthless divine. So we'll be down there with him. We'll go through that. Once the drums are all done, we'll get those delivered to us. And then uh, we'll just start doing all the guitar rhythms. Then that gets handed off to bass. And then while the bass is laying it down, they'll also start doing their guitar solos. We all record from our own home, home studios. Um, so while the bass player is laying tracks to that drum with the scratch rhythms, the guitar players are doing the same thing. Exactly. They start and, doing and, their solos. And then and you have the same raw data that you can work so, on. And- yeah. So for me, I usually wait until uh, the keys are done. Um, but what the thing is the keyboard also, he also needs my, uh, he needs my, my demo vocals so in case he comes up with something. So him and I sort of work in tandem a little bit, but ultimately he'll uh-huh. finish his stems before I ever lay down a final vocal on anything. Well, that makes sense since, you know, uh, melody is going to be a lot between you and the keyboards, I would imagine. Yeah, we're trying, we're trying to, we're just trying to become, become more fluid with each other, you know, not just like, well, they're doing their stuff, they're doing their stuff, and that's the way it shows up. You know, we want to intertwine some of the stuff. So, like, when they hear yeah. me come up with some melody, they're like, how about we change that harmony we're doing to sort of mimic what he's doing in this part? Or, you know, why don't we do, you know, you know, uh, come back to this? And we're just we're trying to play off of each other rather than this is my part, guys. Here, here I go, you know. And can you tell us the cool way that you organize your project? Yeah, so uh, we have this uh, this cool online tool called Asana, A-S-A-N-A, and it's just a free project management to- tool. And I'm sure that anybody that's out there that's a project manager or works in something like that, they're going to be like, we use that at work or <laughs> something, but it's free. And uh, what we do is the, the guitar players will go ahead and they'll create a song. Um, mm-hmm. It could either be Gary, Mark, or even Rick, he writes songs sometimes, and they'll just upload the idea. They'll tag it with the date. And then, um, you know, what will happen is it comes to me and they give me full reign on these songs. They let me handle all the initial structure. So that way everything, I mean, they, they understand that vocals and melodies and hooks are big and key. So right. we're really big into the songwriting portion of it. So I get a Benny Hanna, the shit out of these things, right. chop, them, chop them up, put them however I need, I see fit. And then I come up with my melodies the, the lyrics follow, I demo it, then I upload it as done. So I do that and I just start checking off their ideas. Um, one thing I should mention, especially on this upcoming album, we have two of them. 
Uh-huh. We have uh, songs that we call Frankenstein songs. So, okay. for instance, yes. So, Gary, um, for instance, he's like one song he sent me. A, I saw there were three different songs, and I liked parts from all three of these songs. Now, here's right. the problem. They're in different guitar keys. <laughs> They're uh, different tempos. Wow. But I've learned enough to go in and really, you know, I can't do much about the key changes, but what I can do is I can go and I can make sure that the same tempo, blah, 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 all the way through, cut and splice and put it together. Then I send him a message that says, you know, Frankenstein this bitch. Oh, you took like three of my songs and made it into one. I'm like, yeah, I cut out all the fat and filler I didn't like and I need a killer song. And they're always really cool with that. So they'll re-record it for me and then I'll move forward and get it checked off. And there's another new song. So That's we excellent. did, uh, this is the first, our upcoming album is the first time we have some, I have two of those on this album mm-hmm. uh, that I, basically I took multiple songs and made into one. And um, once that's all done, the band, we're very much a democracy. Um, I handle a majority of the business and I come up with our strategic plan and, but I present it to everyone and we all agree on it. But as far as the music goes, it's very much a democracy. We'll vote on which song we will learn next in our queue. And then that way we're only getting what we agree is the best songs. And then we get in the room, we hash it out. We add all the little bells and whistles and change anything and do last minute structure. And it's done and ready for the album. So So you pretty much know which songs are going to be a winner already before you even step foot everybody together at the same time. And you start rehearsing it as a song, right? I mean, yeah, because we're like, Hey, everyone said, we all like this one. Well, yeah, you already that's got at least six up. of us that are six of us gave us the thumbs up. That's six. Awesome. Awesome. How did the COVID pandemic affect your band and your rehearsals and uh, just moving forward with promoting the Ruthless Divine? So, I mean, we definitely took a hit with with the Ruthless, Ruthless Divine, right? We we released it October 30th through Pure Still Records, and that was smack dab 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. Um but, you know, a lot of bands were, you know, saying, oh, we're going to postpone our release and stuff. Right. We're already always writing anyway. And we're like, you know what? We don't want to just wait. Let's just put it out there and we'll do what we can. So we released it. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to tour until late 2021 when we toured with Soulfly to support it. We were able to shoot a music video for Fires in the Sky, which was mm-hmm. the single that we released off of that so we were able to make that happen to give it some sort of promotion but really we feel like the album sort of lacked promotion um that's why our our online uh, promotions team is sort of re-pushing the album one more time out and we're you know it's getting a lot more we're getting a lot more interviews again a lot more reviews are popping up because for some reason it just you know due to covid a lot of things it, it slipped through the cracks i think yeah um but we took the time off and we wrote for album number three, which is why our fans don't really need to, to wait that long. You know, we're, we're going to start recording it and get it right out. So were you guys able to rehearse together as everybody lived close together? And I know you guys had to make a change on the bass. Oh, the drum. Yeah. OK, so we we weren't able to rehearse for about four months. And then after that, our band, we were very much like, yeah, we're good, you know. We'll wear masks in the room for a while. Um, how you, you feeling good? I'm feeling good. F it. Let's go in there. So, you know, we, we rolled the dice and we were just like, let's go and work. Um, unfortunately, we did have to make a change at the drums. Um, our, our drummer, Noe Luna. The drummer, I'm sorry. He, yeah, no worries. He lost his um, work position. You know, we're, in, we're, you know, we're not a huge band. Like most bands, we do have the day job right. that we have to balance, whether it be part time or full time. Ninety nine percent of all musicians have a day job. So. Exactly, you have to be that one percent. And um, you know, he he lost uh, his way of making money. The cost to, for being in a band at our level um, those add up, and he just was unable to make it happen. You know, um, he was also the one that lived the furthest away. It was two hours each way, so four hour round trip. Uh-huh. You know, and um, so he he. He's, he basically had to step away and um, it was, it was a big hit to us because, you know, we were at a place where we look around and we're like, this is the band, you know, these, these we're, right. we're a group of metal brothers that get along so well. We still get along well, here. yeah. but um, we were lucky enough. We were doing a, uh, a, a filming we were going to do for a, a festival, one of those online cyber fests. 
Right. And um, so we reached out to a drummer that we knew from uh, from Dark Signals and Fall Rise named uh, Isaiah A.R., a uh, very competent, very learned drummer. And he came in and, you know, after a couple of rehearsals, I think, I don't remember who it was in the band, but someone looked at him, they could just see that this look on his face. And they're like, you want to be in this band, don't you? And I think he was like, oh yeah. <laughs> so, and we were feeling the vibes. So that was it. No, no, rehear- no uh, audition necessary. He just became the guy. We did the little thing. And then we just started working on the songs for what would be this third album. So the new album is, do you guys have a release date? Well, we definitely, we want to release it this year. So uh, okay. 2022 for sure. I think we should have it wrapped up in the next three months or so. I don't see why not uh-huh. um, because we don't have any shows lined up right now. We don't, you know, we're going to film one more music video for our song Psychomanium from Ruthless Divine. That'll be the last pin that will stick for promoting that album. But um, other than that, we'll do some music videos. Uh, we'll get some singles ready. And, you know, we'll pick which ones those are. And then um, ultimately we want to, re- we want to release it late summer, maybe fall, and then do another tour, another big tour right around then. That's, that's the vague high level game plan for it. So how, do, how do you guys like pr- the, the ability that you can produce your own records at this point? You know, you have a producer that helps you get the drum tracks down. You mentioned, but then pretty much everybody, is kind of producing their own thing and you guys are working through that system. What kind of freedom does that give you as opposed to say, all everybody shows up at a studio and just bangs it out. Total. The, the word is total, total freedom. You know, I mean, a, you get the full amount of time without somebody, you know, checking the clock going, uh, oh, you're burning money. You're burning money. You know, <laughs> exactly. you can do infinite takes. Um, if you don't like something, like I remember the last time I was recording, I was in a studio and the guy's like, Oh, that's fine. And I didn't like my take. Right. He's like, no, it sounded good. And then the band liked it, but I'm like, I'm the one that's going to have to live with hearing that every time I hear the song. <laughs> yeah, so you're that was the last time. every time. Right. Exactly. So, you know, and as a guitar player, I'm sure, you know, the same thing, you, you hear a little, maybe just a little something. It sticks out. Most people won't hear it, but you're going to hear it. It's going to drive you insane. Exactly. So, you know, so we all we all get the, the the total freedom. I like that you use that word too, freedom to just take our time. I mean, we can't take too long, but take our time, right. do it right, do it how many times we need. And you know, I can shoot for those awkward screams that don't make it on the album. But I'm like, <laughs> oh, that voice cracked. Glad no one heard that. You know, right? So get, yeah. You were yeah. the only witness, and and you were, and it's going to stay that way. <laughs> exactly. I don't have to kill anybody. It's all good. <laughs> But you can try anything you want and like there's right. not you don't ever have the stress of of like you say that clock behind you or just it's it's just different when you know a bunch of people are listening in a control room even if they're your best friends or whatever it puts a different kind of mental pressure on wouldn't you say than when you're relaxing in your home studio just i would agree i would agree 100 percent. another thing that i noticed um and I only noticed this within the last year when I was diving back into like my old catalog. Uh-huh. And I realized that from the, as soon as I started doing my own vocals, all of a sudden it wasn't just one, two, three tracks. All of a sudden I'm like, wow, I was doing great harmonies, harmony tracks, backing tracks, things like that. Cause I'm sitting there and I'm listening back this back and I'm coming up with the ideas rather than going in and sticking with those, you know, here's the main vocal. I'm going to double it for background, you know, right. Yeah. Right. Now you go like, what if I had an octave on this part? Now, exactly. what if we throw in some harmonies behind the vocal? Or, uh, right. And you, I have no idea what that harmony is going to be. So let me figure it out. <laughs> yeah. You know, walk over to the keyboard or the guitar, try something out or how whatever works for you. That's that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to throw in and throw out there for fans um, about what's happening and uh, what they can look forward to from Nivian? Well, so um, for that bit, for Navian, I, and then I know Navian. No, 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 no. So I, I, I know. I'm, here's what I'm gonna say. We pronounced the name wrong. So here's the thing: the band was okay. So the band was named by one of the founding guitar players, Claudius Kramer, who is now the guitarist in Possessed. He 
was the guy that recruited me into the band. And he, he was there only for the first year before he right. decided that he was, he wanted to do something a little different. Okay. Great friend, great friend. But his former band Serpent Seraph had a song called Tears of Navayan. So wow. that's where we learned to pronounce the name from. Later on, we learned from people all over the world, it's either pronounced Nivian or uh, there's another one, Nivian or Nava, 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 Navian or something. Uh-huh. But it depends on what where you're at, if you're in Europe, blah, blah, blah. So we just laugh and we say Navian because that's the way we've always been saying it. And we say that's the dumb American way to say it. <laughs> so I never, I never uh, correct anybody because. So, OK, so what does it mean? Oh, so it's uh, from what I've learned, it's from Arthurian legend, you know, King Arthur and all that. Right. So Nivian or Nivian was a woman that seduced Merlin, the magician. And what she did is she used her sexual prowess to get him to teach her his sorcery. But then she ah. turned on him and used it against him to kill him. And that was her name. So I was like, I'm like, I don't technically remember that in the movie Excalibur, which is an awesome movie oh. I loved. But no, they, they had they had like Morgan, Morgan Arthur's stepdaughter or, or, or kill him or something whatever. like that, right? So I think daughter. they kind of looped it in. Like I think they kind of melded that yeah. the characters. But that's I learned that, and then when I learned that, they had already named the band before I was in. I was like, oh, that's different, and it's cool. All right, no that's off, funny. no theory, I guess. Yeah, it's <laughs> funny that you remember X Caliber. It was actually a pretty oh. good movie in the day. You know, love that movie. One of my favorites. God, that's from I I forget eighty eighty one. I think it was eighty one. I think but, but it on. has like Patrick Stewart in it. It has Liam Neeson, Liam Neeson in it. Yeah. It has all these guys, you know, that would later, you know, become a lot more famous. Right. And, uh, and still, I don't think there's. I don't think there's a better King Arthur movie. I've seen the modern ones. No, I agree. I don't know about you, but I, they I am with too you much for me, you know? brother. I am with you on that one. <laughs> But, uh, for, but yeah, so for the band Divine, I mean, we, we covered most of it, right? We're getting it ready to go into the right. studio. We got some new music videos for the new album and one more for this current album coming out. Uh, we will try to do a tour in the summer, fall when we release the album. So that's ultimately what the band has in store. I will release a little bit of information just for you that for the fans that I've never said on any of my interviews yet. <clears throat> After that, we will be doing a EP that we're going to just self-release. It's going to be... Uh, very cool acoustic versions of some songs from the first two albums and then one new song. Oh, and cool. that's just for us. We want to, we want to test the water as a self-release and see how it works without using a label. See if right. we have the pipelines we can, you know, make more money off it. We just want to test it. And we figured a nice EP like that. We'll see what happens. So that's going to, as soon as we're done tracking drums for this, mm-hmm. we'll ultimately most likely be tracking drums for that EP, we're basically going kind to of piggyback, and but that'll be released shortly after the album as well. So okay, so, so that's for Navian. Okay, um, for, for Navian. And what about you? I understand you have your uh, finger in a few other pies. Yeah. So uh, this last year, I mean, I was up to five projects. I walked away from two. I'm, I'm no longer yet only five. <laughs> right. So um, I finished. I finished. An, so I finished my God. Fifth, I think, Magica album with uh-huh. with the band um, it was cool. We had Matt Thompson on drums from King Diamond and stuff, and it, it was a great release. But ultimately, that band was had become because we took a hiatus in 2010. Right. We regrouped in uh, like 2019 as a, a surprise to everybody. Did one album. It did great, but at that time, it became a side project for everybody. Right. So that one was easy to walk away from. I was like, well, that was fun. Hope the fans enjoyed that one album. Um, I did two albums with Hell Scream. I watched away, I walked away. For people that don't know who Hell Scream is, it's the exact same band as Cage or the Three Tremors. Oh, um, okay. It's just me singing instead of you know Ripper or Sean Peck. So we have two albums out there called Hell Scream. It's basically Cage with Norman Skinner on vocals. Um, and you know, it was always a, a studio thing we never got in the same room or ever played a show so i walked away from that so right. i'm left so kind of the same thing you got tracks and you put some vocals on it for exactly them. and we okay. just did it that way got it, yeah. got it done and back to them and yeah, then got the some thing. cool you know power or speed metal it's more like traditional speed metal stuff but uh-huh. yeah, very cool stuff out there um but so what i still have left is my solo band skinner i'm uh-huh. um, actually got three and a half songs left for vocal tracking and then my new album the dark design goes off to uh, Zach Oren, 
who did our Ruthless Divine album. He's mixing and mastering that. So it's uh, 13 tracks. Very, very cool stuff. And that'll be my uh, second. Sorry to interrupt. Um, who, who's your band on your solo album? So it's it's a mix. So um, former, the, so my Navian drummer from, from the first two albums, Druid King and Ruthless Divine, he's been my drummer on my last solo album as well as this one. Awesome. Um, my bass player remains the same. Um, funny enough, my bass player's out on tour Soulfly right now with his other band short views. Nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's funny how that works, but um, so that's, that's a good connection. That's yeah. Fun. So Jim Pegram's the bass player. He's been on, he was on my last solo album as well uh-huh. as this one. He's also my former, uh, Imagica bass player. So people will be familiar with him. Keyboards are all done by Aaron Rock, uh, Robich, who's, um, the Vines keyboardist. So he's doing that. So the guitar is where it becomes different. Um, I have one song with uh, Jeremy Von Epp who plays in bands such as the watchers in Vinci machine. Um, he also was in black gates with the Dan Nelson from anthrax. So we did a song together. Good friends. I'm working with a new guitarist out of, uh, I think he lives in Ohio named, uh, Jamie Robertson. He's a freelance guy. He wrote about um, a good fourth of the album with me. We had fun. And then, um, Abel three, who's a, a solo guitar player. He did a good 70, percent of the album with me um he's got a few solo albums out um uh, guitar solo albums out and stuff so so um between um nivian and uh skinner what what's the musical difference like i mean you have a band already where you're doing something Skinner's- how, hard, how hard are you i mean what Skin- what direction does skinner and what does that offer that nivian skinner's does? skinner's way more modern um yeah, I mean, I still take a lot of that traditional sound. I mean, there's like certain songs that have like a Queensryche feel, but uh-huh. mixed mixed with like Kill Switch Engage. You know, there's a lot more uh, growl, death, death metal vocals on this. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, I have like an acoustic ballad on there that's very almost Alice in Chains sounding. So, it, you know, it's um, you get a lot of different sounds, but it does from song to song, the album is cohesive. You, you listen to it, you're like, I get, I get the feeling of what this album is about, but it's very dynamic. So uh, very much. I was able to pick the creme de la creme of songs that were submitted to me. I mean, there was a lot of stuff on the cutting floor. I only picked the songs from different musicians that I was like, I love this. I can work with this. So, so um, basically they're all a co-writing process then, correct? Like, yeah, they're uh, everybody like you're, getting, you're getting guitar riffs. Um, even on your solo project and you're doing a collaboration and coming up with something unique. It's, between, and what's funny is it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's the same as with Navayan. They submit it to me. I take it from there. I'm in charge of the structure, the lyrics, the melodies, and they just say, okay, yeah, it sounds cool, man. I can't wait to hear what you do. Ultimately, I can't well, wait to hear the final product. Yeah. Well, that seems like an easy way to keep things separate, like, because you're all, you're only writing to the stuff your Navayan guys send you is right. the lion. so you're not writing a bunch of songs and going i'm not sure which project this should go with or no. right so. i have stolen a few navian submitted tracks but that's for my <laughs> last and final project that i'm working on called elementus uh-huh so elementus has been in the works for years uh, already um i'm working it's it's a it's my first ever concept album it's oh, 20, nice. 22 tracks Ooh. i've got various musicians from around the world on it a lot bigger names than me, um, a lot of guest music, guest singers, because you know, um, people that I've been wanting to work with for so long that are that have, of course, I had to shell out some money for this, but you know, <laughs> but I'm I'm very excited about it. I have three songs left that we have not started on. There's no music for, but the other, what would that be? Uh, there's 22 tracks. So was I minus three? Another 19 songs are written. Yeah and ready to, to be tracked, but I um, have three more to go. I just haven't found the right songs that haven't had the right guys submit the right stuff. to the fit with what yep. you're doing already. But that's a big thing. It's a very, I don't want to give too much away, but it's sort of a, a vampire love story with a supernatural twist. It was, well, that sounds cool. So obviously two disc territory. It, if, it is. You know, uh, um, absolutely. So when and it's very symphonic, very symphonic metal with uh power metal and traditional metal thrown in but very symphonic way more keyboards and such yes orchestration is huge okay so when you're getting guest musicians on a project like that 
how were you able to go about that? Did you have to go through everybody's management or did you just people that you've met on tour or yeah, it's how, did, how did that come together for you? It's been a mixture. I will say the singers have been a mixed bag. Uh-huh. A couple of them have been, I've met in passing. So we are like Facebook and Instagram friends and I can direct message them. Some of them I have no prior uh, contact with. So I did have to go through their management and, uh-huh. you know, come up with the, the payment terms, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, and then a lot of the actual music, the, the, the core guitar players and stuff, uh-huh. they're just, they're guys that I know. Um, and, you know, some of them, you know, a couple of them are just very unknown. You know, uh-huh. they're just from my area, but they've written some really good stuff. So, you know, um, so it varies in degrees of, um, I, I would say, popularity between the musicians, you know. So, but I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy with how it's it's coming together. Yeah, it, that's, it, does, that's awesome. it does give me stress, though. I'm like, oh, this is a lot. Man. This is a lot. <laughs> so, so if you're approaching a band, a little more famous band um, for their singer, um, is that, are they basically just, you know, paid a flat fee for their time? And it's usually just with the singer, the band. That, that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, just the singer, is, the singer will be like, they're getting their, their guest vocal fee and they're not having to write any lyrics or anything because I've already written. And the label doesn't care as long as the, he gets paid or. or yeah. And then sometimes they, they will say, you know, I have to put in the liner notes, you know, appears courtesy of X sure. label. Well, that's or easy. Yeah, that's easy enough, right? Yeah, you're right. Just a graphic and a typing it in. So, well, awesome. I really enjoy talking to you, Norman, and looking forward to hearing from you guys again. And definitely keep me in the loop when the album comes out. Thanks for being our guest here today, uh, Metal Express Radio. Absolutely, man. Oh, thank you so much. I had a blast. <laughs>